y'all hear that beeping sound, that means I'm starting. Oh, Sounds like an evacuation alarm. Okay. I did a class. Almost all of you were in the class on uh, new creation. Taught it, I had 16 lessons on new creation. What do you remember about it? We're made in God's image. Huh? We're made in God's image. We're made in God's image? Over the creation, yeah. That's that's really the that's really what the class was about. Was our goal, our purpose? Who are we? Like you said, created in God's image, God's intention uh, is for us to rule with Him over the creation, to be His children. Um, and that was the purpose of the 16-week course, or 16 lessons. Some of those classes we weren't here, or I wasn't here, but uh, we uh, are all very distracted over here. Well, I brought a muffin for Pee Wee, and I dropped it. So Everybody named Pee Wee, raise your hand. She brought them up. Pee Wee, as they know. Okay. Especially the grandmas, they know. Uh -huh. Well, a lot of the class, most of the of the classes were kind of technical, and we were. I was busting some paradigms in the in the course, and uh, trying to get us, I think, better squared away to understand God's word. So, um, I have a tendency to be real technical, and I study a lot, and I have a tendency to really want to dig deep and then teach it, but my weakness is, so what? That's, that's my weakness. Uh, I always had to remind myself when I was the preacher here, uh, I'd, go, I'd get a lesson all prepared, and I'm real excited because I'm digging into some really deep stuff, and then I have to be reminded, so what? Because I could be satisfied just to get up and preach what the Bible says and not really deal with so what. So I thought what I want to do is I want to have a class on the so what. And so I'm calling the this last started last week called Living New Creation. And it's the so what. And last week, what we did, we we went to Ezekiel 1. We're not going to go there. But we went to Ezekiel 1, and Ezekiel is given a vision of the throne of God. And, uh, it, you know, you remember the vision, a dark storm cloud comes up from the north, and uh, it's thunder and lightning and, you know, tr terrible sounds of thunder and and as it gets closer, he notices what looks like a burning uh, a metal that's been you know burned, heated until it glows hot, right in the middle of that cloud. And as it gets closer, he's able to see that what that cloud, what that glowing metal looks like, and it, it's a throne. It's got, and it's it. He describes it in detail. And these four living creatures, all of them, each one has a little bit of a different image and their their hooves their legs with their hooves come down to the ground with a wheel attached so there's four wheels and they've got wings and they're holding up their they're touching wings the four of them you got one on each corner they're touching wings and above them is a pane of of crystal and on the crystal is a golden throne and on the throne is we're looking at God. And he says, it's a man. Now, I covered that to try to help us understand what God is doing with us. Okay, we learned in the last uh, class 
no, not the, the last uh, lessons subject, new creation, like you said, we learn that God is bringing us to a new creation and us with new uh, recreated bodies. I say recreated because we get bodies like Jesus. Jesus didn't get a brand new body. He got a, a remade body that was better. And we're going to get one just like it. And we're going to we're going to sit down on thrones, and in a sense, we've already sat down on thrones. We'll see that today, and we co-rule with God over the new creation that's also resurrected. That was God's intention in the in the beginning. And last class period was how He brings us from we looked all the way back to the creation and Adam and Eve and their fall, and how He brings us to where we are now and to where we're going to be hopefully shortly. And so this class period, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, uh, hit some of those points again because where I want to go, I've got to remind us some of what we've studied. We, uh, we so we were created to rule. And uh, he created Adam and Eve and told them to rule over the creation. Uh, an evil spirit that we that the Bible calls Satan enters the picture, comes in as a serpent, and uh, tells Adam and Eve a lie. lies to him about who God is and God's intentions, and Eve believes it. Adam, it, it appears to me from the text that Adam is with her when this happens. Uh, it's just an, a hint from the text. It says that uh, she went ahead and took of the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It says, and gave it to her husband who was, who was with her. She, and that was the point. She, the, the fruit was attractive. She kind of, I guess, was tempted a little bit, but here comes the serpent. He said, well, why don't you go ahead and eat it? She said, well, God's told us not to because, and he said, ah, God's not telling you the truth. So she took it, and then it says she gave it to her husband who was with her. So my impression, and it, you have to make your own decision on this, is that Adam was standing there, watching the whole ordeal. And I think this is why uh, God holds Adam to be more guilty than the woman. Yeah, and, and the, the, the... He wasn't, and that's that's uh, 1 Timothy 2, uh, yeah, two, the end of the chapter, it says the woman was deceived, but the man wasn't. And we think, oh, well, that's, you know, that speaks badly of the woman and good of the man. No, it doesn't. That means that she, when she ate of the fruit, she thought that it was the right thing to do. When Adam did, he knew he wasn't doing the right thing. So that, that speaks, I think, more, uh, contrary or more badly for the male than it did for the female. And I think that's why the consequence came down because of what he did. Are y'all understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of innuendos in there that, uh, you know, things that we can draw on it. But anyway, what, what we did is uh, when we, you know, living in God, the whole point, I think, is living in God 
is freedom, is life. And when we turn our lives over to Satan, then we lose that freedom. And the consequence is death. Uh, so uh, it's like Esau, you know, the story. He, he, he sold his birthright for a, a bowl of beans. And that's kind of what we do. We sell our birthright as heirs of God um, for a bowl of soup. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans, okay? That's an Oklahoma way of saying it. And so uh, man begins to worship the creature rather than the creator. Now, why do I say that? Because that's what they did. You, you look in the Bible, you look back in history, and they begin to worship images of animals and uh, humans, images of humans. But the ancient peoples worshiped more images of, ad, of animals. And, uh, and I, I believe that uh, man becomes like what he worships. Uh, if you're going to worship the cre creation, if you're going to worship the creature, then you, you begin to act like it. Um, and, I, and I believe that's, that's one reason why I wanted to teach this segment on living new creation is because Satan has so duped us and he still dupes us. Even in this modern time, I, I'm convinced that the, the troubles that we're having in the world and in America, in the United States today, is because Satan has duped us and we still have bought into the lie, <coughs> to his lies. And it's because we, we do not understand who we are. We don't yet understand our place in the creation. Now we can we give lip service. Yeah, I, I get it. I understand it. But it's one thing to understand something intellectually. It's another thing to, to understand it emotionally, to where it's part of your being. And and so Satan, we sold, who, who did the world belong to before the fall? God, and we were given dominion over it, right? And so we became lords over this creation because God gave it to us to rule. But by the time we get to the New Testament, uh, Jesus makes comments about the consequence of what we did. Uh, in John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus says, "This Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. So who does he refer to Satan as? The ruler of this world. Well, who was supposed to be the ruler of this world? We were supposed to be the rulers of the world. And so and and because of us, God, the ruler of this world. So, Bill, when Satan, so what I'm hearing you say this, when Satan was cast down, then our rule was taken away? No, he was already, he was the ruler of the world uh, from the time of Adam and Eve up till the time of Jesus. And even after that, <laughs> look at, uh, if you want, look at First or 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. I'll let you turn over there if you've got your Bibles. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. And I'm just going to pick it up in verse 4. There's a bigger context, but it'd take more to read it. And I, Paul says what I want us to get in verse 4. He says, in whose case the God of this world 
has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. How does Paul refer to Satan? It's in, it's in the text. This, the God of this world. Now this is after the crucifixion. This is after the resurrection. When Jesus is tempted in the desert, Satan claims it's been given to me. Right. And I can give it to whoever I want. Right. And and I don't believe it's an empty claim. Because I think Jesus would have challenged that. So I I believe my my view is God created us humans to rule over the, the creation. We we sold it. We gave it up, turned it over to Satan. Voluntarily. We gave up our rule and turned it over to him. And he then rules this world even up until today. Now, whether it is like uh, uh, an official granting of authority by God or he rules this world because he's the one we obey, which seems like that might be more the case. I mean, if we look at the world today, there's a lot of trouble in our world. A lot of trouble. I mean, you look at what's going on with Russia. You look at what's going on in China. Uh, you you look at all the refugees fleeing the Middle East. Me, the even you know the Middle East, the East. Uh, refugees going all over Africa. Refugees fleeing from. South America, refugees fleeing, coming into the United States, all the trouble. The, and then, uh, who are we serving? Who, who does that reflect? Does it reflect God? No, it reflects Satan. All the killing going on in Ukraine, the, the, the murders and killings of ISIS, by ISIS. And here, the city. Oh, the, all the shootings we had? That is because people and humans, just like Eve, were being duped. Now, a lot of them are like Adam and just wants to do evil. Now, why would we want to do evil? God said, before and after the flood, he said, the intent of man's heart is always on evil. That's in us. That's, that's part of, of who we are. We're inclined, it says, towards evil from our youth. And so... What needs to happen? New creation. Our inclination towards evil is part of the old creation. We've talked about this in the previous course on, you know, from uh, Romans 7 where Paul talks about the propensity to sin is in the flesh, is in our bodies. And his last cry in that text is, uh, who will set me free from the body of this death. And so Satan capitalizes on that. And he appeals to it and draws us to rebel against our creator. And so... When we, when, we, when we serve evil, we're, we're serving Satan. We're putting him on the throne. Our, our Lord is who we serve. We're either serving Satan or we're serving Jesus. And our inclination 
is towards evil. And so we, and I believe one of the reasons why God gave us the law of the Old Testament was to show us that we don't have the ability to live the way we're supposed to live. Man's inclination was towards what? Sin. If man's inclination was towards the law of God, that's what God... So, God does bring us, and this was part of the previous course, where I talked about the giving of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit then begins to rebirth who we are, or our inclination. So that our inclination then becomes to serve God rather than to serve sin. And so, what I pointed out then, and uh, in the course on just called New Creation, where I ended up is that God wants us to come over here to being who he wanted us to be originally to rule over creation. We gave it up we sinned, we rebelled against God, turned the world that was supposed to be ours, turned it over to the rule of Satan. And so God begins the process of bringing us along so that eventually he will make a covenant through Jesus, through the man Jesus. And in order for a covenant to be in effect, what has to happen? The death of the covenant maker, according to Hebrews chapter 9, and so, uh, if Jesus had not died on the cross, we couldn't have a covenant. And the glory of the covenant now is we have the forgiveness of our sins. We ha and I like the word amnesty. Have y'all noticed that I use the word amnesty? What does amnesty mean to you? It's wiped away. You know, if our if our government declared amnesty for everybody who's ever sold drugs, then it's 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 wiped away. Uh, let me let me, uh, you know a lot of Greek, a lot of English comes from Greek. A lot of it comes from Greek, and I didn't really understand English until I learned Greek. Um, what is, I'm going to ask, I didn't prep her for this. Becky knows Greek real well, probably better than I do. Uh, she knows conversational Greek better than I do. Uh, what does Nima mean? Yeah, Nima. M N. means to remember, memory or remember something. In Greek, when you put an A in front of a word, it negates it. Do you recognize the word there? Amnesia. amnesia. What does amnesia mean? You don't remember it. <laughs> and so amnesty, see, it's the same. Is that right? Amnesty. It, they're the same. Amnesty means it's not remembered anymore. And so that's why I have gotten to where we, we get, we're, we're churchy folks. And we've got our own vocabulary, and we hear it for so much and so many years that it ceases to have, I think, real meaning to us. If I said, we've got the forgiveness of our sins, we're all going, yeah, right, great, but you really aren't taking that in.
And so I come up with another word, which means forgiveness of our sins. It means forgiveness. But we have to think about it. We have to think amnesty. Okay, he's saying we have amnesty. God grants us amnesty. What does that mean? It means it's forgotten. When it comes to our sins, amnesia happens. Amnesty. And so God, the, the first thing that had to happen for us to actually get to this side of the cross where we are able to live as new creation people, we, have to, we had to have our sins wiped out. We, we, had to, we had to experience amnesty, total amnesty. Because if we don't, then we carry that guilt. And that guilt prevents us from really being who, from really being new created people, new creation. Okay, y'all are kind of looking at me like, huh? <laughs> what do you understand me to be trying to say? What am I trying to say? Well, to be knocked in the head. So you. <laughs> well, I understand your meaning as far as God. Yeah. Jesus, I, our Savior, and you with our sins. Well, I do, and intellectually, I can say, oh, I don't know that. You know, but you can hear it still in your life. Mm -hmm. And when you know when you, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. again, I'm talking to you a thousand years ago. I know, that again, but, but you just did. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, remi it reminds <laughs> me, it reminds me of the co comical joke story I used to hear. You know, everybody's, the, the day of judgment has come, and we're all standing in this huge line with billions of people lined up at the pearly gates, and we're all waiting to, to go up there, and there's Peter up there sitting with Jesus at the, at the judge's desk, you know, with the gavel, and pretty soon you hear this cheer and this roar, and everybody's cheering and shouting and hallelujah, and it, and it, and it slowly moves back towards you. You're in the back, towards the back of the line. And they're all cheering. You said, what, 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 what? And they said, drinking don't count. <laughs> it was a different joke, but I didn't want to tell that one. But, you know, all right, so if, if, we, if drinking don't count, or if something didn't count, evil thoughts don't count. What does that mean? He's not going to consider evil thoughts. If you had evil thoughts, he's not going to consider it. That didn't count. I know. Whenever I didn't go to church but, for 30 okay, years. going to church don't count. That, that was really the story, the joke. It doesn't count. It doesn't count. When, when God gives amnesty to you for your sins, it's not for certain sins. And it means they are wiped out. They don't count. They don't count against you. It's, I'm trying to, I know, I'm trying to get my point across. There's a, there's a, you don't have to forgive yourself if it's amnesty. Listen, if there's, if, if, if amnesty is granted to you for any and all your sins, past, present, and future, then you don't have to worry about it because they don't count. Are, are y'all understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. The difference, the impact that has, they yeah. don't count. Well, I've got a, oh, I've, I've got a problem. I lose my temper and I yell and scream and 
I act unchristlike and I do this and I do that. And Jesus says, that doesn't count. Don't worry about it. You know, some, I, I think sometimes the reasons we even put in our minds, and it's hard for us to understand that, because as kids, when we do something wrong, and we do something else wrong, the parents sometimes bring up, oh, well, you did this. And since you don't let your child forget what they did wrong. You know why we do that? Because Satan's the god of this world. Yeah. We, we imitate, we, we were right, we were raised the same way. Yeah. And so we're imitating what we learned, and, and, it, and it hurts. We, we train our children that their performance is what counts. You're good or bad based on your performance. And what we should have done is say, look, you are my child. I love you. You're a good person, so quit acting this way. You follow me? Yeah. And, and so what we've done is we've grown up with what I've heard called the performance trap. And we all suffer with the performance trap. And so that's where we think that our value is built in our performance. Our performance determines our value. Do we value somebody that has a, a super good job and earns a lot of money more than we do a person pushing a cart around on the street? Why? That's Satan. That's his work. That person earning billions of dollars, and there are some billionaires, is not worth more than that guy pushing the cart on the street, bumming for a dollar. He's not worth more. But because we have fallen into Satan's trap, the performance trap, we think he is worth more. Are y'all? Yeah. And, and this is why I want to go over it, because I, I think that we uh, have a tendency to, uh, to fall into this snare. And we, we don't really, even though intellectually you can go, yeah, 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 I get that. A man, God is like a man sitting on a throne. He's one of us. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus is God. Jesus is a man, is God who became a man. Yeah, that's wonderful, but we don't get it. And we buy into this idea that God is angry with us and that he's built this huge gulf between, our sins have created this huge gulf, and God can't span that we can't span the gulf because we're guilty and we deserve to die. And God is going to kill us unless we unless He can kill Jesus in our place. And baloney, baloney, baloney. And and we we don't we we know the text like the woman caught in adultery. I don't know if you've ever really, I mean, I'm sure you've thought, but we get these ideas that God is can't fail, can't have anything to do with sin, right? We get that idea. And yet here he is, here's God talking to this woman caught in adultery. We said, look, look, you know. She says, yeah, but I'm, I, I know it doesn't say she said that, but let's imagine she says, well, let's, let's do it. The, the men brought her and threw her down at Jesus' feet. And we know Jesus is God. They didn't know it, but we know it. And so what he does is what God does. They throw her at his feet and said, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. And Jesus said, well, we don't count that. We don't count that. Adulterers have amnesty. Oh, how'd that make you feel just now when I said that? Are you comfortable with that? Would you be excited for a golden spoon woman? That's right. Did she? I don't know. I don't know either. 
I doubt it if she's a typical human being. If, if she went and sinned no more, she's better than I am. No, doesn't say anything about the man. Probably was one of the guys standing in the crowd. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, are y'all getting the point I'm trying to make? I'm, we're not going to count that. That's right. So Bill, so we'll never get over this. I mean, until we die, because sinning and stuff. Because uh, I knew something that happens to you and I when somebody cuts us off, and we say something like, uh, "Well, just because we said our sins are, what we just said our sins are forgiven." So why do we keep doing? We keep doing it every time. Well, and it's, and, and I believe that we we may never probably never overcome all sins but the Holy Spirit if we if we give ourselves to the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives then we do begin to overcome things like that if I have found for myself that if I focus on a sin issue that I have and I commit myself to bringing it before God every time I do it. Then the Spirit begins to work in my life. If every time you said, you moron, you fool, blankety blank, get out of my way, you almost, and, and, and we go, whoa, 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 Jesus, I am, Father, I am sorry. I said, I had a true story, and I, I hesitate to tell stuff about myself, but I tell you beforehand, I'm a sinner, and I have all kinds of sin issues. So I'm going to share one that I kind of overcame for a while. Uh, you know my background. I had a very rough background, and so when somebody did wrong to me, I was ready to throw down. Okay. I wasn't a real tough guy, but I thought I was. And uh, I remember in Greece, my habit was to get real confrontational. And, uh, for example, I pulled up. They have these kiosks that are booths. They sell magazines and gum and everything you can imagine in these kiosks. And I pulled up in front of one, and the guy didn't want, and I got out, and the guy got out of the kiosk, came around to me, and starts yelling at me for parking in front of his kiosk. And I'm saying, well, I'm not going to be here very long. And he, and he really gets rough with me, and he pushes me. And I said, you do that again, I'm going to rip your arm off and beat you to death with it. I, I actually said that. And he looked at me. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's not the only time I've done that. I, I was in the habit of doing that. And I, had, I, had, I, I knew it was a sin, and so I committed that to God. I committed that sin to God and asked him to help me overcome it. And the guy freaked out, backed away, got back in his little booth, and I walked on, and I got a little bit ways down the street, and I came back, and I went up to him. I said, look. And he was concerned. <laughs> and, and you need to re realize Greeks are kind of smaller people. And so, you know, I'm not a real big guy, but to him I was a big guy. And I was in my late 20s at the time. But I went up to him. I said, look, I, I want to apologize to you. I said, I'm a child of God. I follow Jesus. And Jesus would not have acted that way. And I'm so sorry. Well, you do that very often. Guess what? You don't do that very often. You know? And and uh, it, and, and that's how, when we submit ourselves to God, that's when the Holy Spirit then begins to work in us. We, we have to identify our sins and recognize them and say, okay, I, I, I'm going to commit this to you, Lord. Help me to overcome this. Well, 
he doesn't just reach over and say, okay, overcome. You've got to go through the effort of, of letting the Spirit work in you to actually overcome it. You know, driving the car, if every time I called somebody a fool or a moron and I caught myself, if I chased that person down in the car and went up and said, look, I, I'm sorry you cut me off back there. I, I called you a fool and, and I sinned terribly and I'm, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. How many times do you think you'd do that? How many times do you think doing that before you actually stopped calling people a fool or a moron? Are, are y'all understand what I'm saying? We correct ourselves, and it, and I think we have to put, we have to go to the effort of correcting ourselves in front of people. Because that's what repentance means. You sinned against that person, you've got to, you need to repent to that person. Now, don't take this, just forget I said anything. About <laughs> I don't think it's a good idea to chase them. No, they're wrong, Right, but that, but I, I, I'm just trying to give an illustration. If I've got an issue, if I've got a problem where I'm sinning against other people, or I'm thinking evil, uh, there have been times when I've told a person and apologized to a person and told them, you know, I, I'm sorry I judged you, uh, I, I thought evil about you, and it's not because of you, it's actually because of the evil that's in me, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Yes, sir? Uh, the thing about sin that strikes me is, is interesting is the devil does not only get strong in his sin, he gets stronger. And that is where the fear, you know, comes in with these things that are happening, the devil's getting stronger. You know, God has has delivered us as his children to overcome this. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's time for us to end, and let me just remind you this this is where I'm trying to go. I'm trying to say we are in the segment between the cross and resurrection, and the final resurrection where we get where we enter into that new created state. In the meantime, God has given his Holy Spirit, Jesus poured it out upon us, has given us his Holy Spirit so that we can begin to, to live as new created people, so that we can begin to live as new creation. We are actually, and we didn't get to this, I wanted to talk about how God has put us on the throne with Jesus right now. Even though we're headed for the throne, there's a present reality of that. And we are, it's like we're, we're princes and princesses. And Jesus is on the throne, and, our, and when the resurrection finally comes, we're going to sit down literally on that throne. I say literally, I don't know, all of these are metaphors, I'm sure. But we're going to enter into that rule in a more finite way. But right now, we, we are on the throne. And we're ruling right now. And that's part of being new creation. Well, how do, how do prince and princesses act? How do, really, we say, well, I'm a child of God. Really? I know you are, but how does a child of God act? Well, how does God act? Well, I don't know. Yeah, you do. Look at Jesus. That's how God acts as a human. That's, that's, it, it, that's our goal. That's who we are supposed to be living like. Well, how do we? How do I get there? Well, we've got we've got to kind of reverse course. We've got to get Satan's rule out of us, which has been built in us since the day we were born, and grew up in families that 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 they too were victims. And we've got to start thinking differently. And I mean, if you stop and think about it, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about instinctively acting as new created people, where it's instinct. I don't have to sit there and think, oh, well, okay, I needed to overcome my anger, so I'm going to go apologize to this guy. 
it needs to get to the point to where I don't act like that to begin with. Are you understanding me? Okay, let's go. 